بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته continue on in our study of بلوغ مرام the book of marriage we reached the 884th hadith and this is in chapter 3 the bridal gift or the mahar or sadaq narrated Amr ibn Shu'ib on his father's authority from his grandfather Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if any woman remarries for a or if any woman marries for a dowry a gift or a promise before contracting the marriage it belongs to her as for whatever is fixed to her after contracting the marriage it belongs to whoever it has been given the most worthy gift a man is honored with is what he gets on account of the marriage of his daughter or sister reported by Ahmed and Al-Arba except a tirmidhi in this hadith, it means that whatever is decided before the marriage uh, is considered the dowry, is considered the maha. And it belongs to the woman, as we mentioned uh, prior to this hadith. Whether it is from money, gold, ornaments, clothes, uh, land, a house, or something else, she is the sole owner of that item, that item that was given to her. If anything is given to her relatives after the marriage, that will not be considered a part of the dowry and it will not belong to her. It is a gift from him uh, to whosoever it is given. Meaning the husband, if the husband decides to give some other gift or they had some sort of uh, stipulation or it's from their custom to give a gift aside from the mahar, this is something else aside from the mahar, uh, then that is okay uh, to be given to the, uh, that relative, you know, whether it be the father or the brother or whatever, according to the custom or according to that stipulation. Things decided before the marriage are considered the dowry and delivered later to her relatives is a dowry and she is the owner of all those things. So the, the fact that something is decided upon prior to the marriage, uh, then this is considered, and, and given, this is considered the mahar. This is considered the dowry or the sadaq. But other than that, can be given as a gift to the family if that is from the custom or that is something that uh, is known from that, uh, from that, that custom. Some of the other benefits we gain from this hadith is that the that there it is permissible to make it conditional to give some sort of gift as a uh, out of respect for the family for the father or for the uh, the brother or something like this uh, this is after the engagement after the nikah after the the marriage so if it's, there's some uh, stipulation uh, that after the marriage there is some sort of gift and there, you know you find this in uh, some of the customs some of the traditional customs that they actually give gifts then this is a, this is permissible and we learn this from this hadith that this is a permissible practice but if it is uh, but as, as we mentioned prior to this that taking something from the mahar taking something from the woman's dowry or the money that is given prior to the Akhtin Kya or the prior to the marital contract, then this is considered the dowry and this is reserved for the woman. And this is her right. So the family does not have uh, authority to take that from her. Another benefit of this hadith is that it also shows that a man 
can be given uh, a out of respect uh, some gift for giving away his sister in marriage or for giving away his daughter in marriage meaning this is a kind of respectful custom this isn't a, a transaction of buying and selling but this is a, as a gift out of respect uh, within the context of that culture that uh, that this is uh, something which is permissible and this is what we learn from this hadith and this is not from the means of rushwa or uh, cheating or bribery so to speak but rather this is out of uh, just a gift out of respect which some cultures uh, practice another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us uh, that uh, the sadaq or the mahar um, that it's permissible to be a small amount or a large amount and we already mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said and this is from his authentic sunnah that the best mahar is the uh, the less the one of the lesser amount meaning to not make it a burden but something which is reasonable and maybe not high in value to not make a burden upon the uh, suitor. But it is permissible, of course, if they have agreed upon uh, that the mahara can be a lot or it can be uh, a small amount. Moving on to the next hadith, narrated al alqama on the authority or Alqama on the authority of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala he was asked about a man who had married a woman and had not fixed a dowry for her and he did not consummate the marriage with her till he died Ibn Mas'ud uh, radiallahu ta'ala replied she should receive a dowry similar to what the women of her community receive without decrease or increase she must observe the idda period of waiting before remarrying and is entitled to a share of the inheritance. Then he got up and said, Allah's Messenger uh, uh, entitled the inheritance. Ma'kul ibn Sinan al Ashja'i then got up and said, Allah's Messenger وسلم, ruled the same as your ruling regarding Birwa, daughter of Washa. A woman of our tribe. Ibn Mas'ud was delighted with it, reported by Ahmed and Al Arba. A Tirmidhi graded it as Sahih or authentic, while a group of Hadith scholars graded it as Hassan. Uh, in this Hadith, the Hadith of Al Qama, radiallahu uh, ta'ala, on Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala, uh, we find uh, many or several benefits of this hadith and one of the benefits of this hadith is the fadila or the greatness of uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud and the way in which this is illustrated in this hadith is that Abdullah bin Mas'ud through his ijtihad had tawfiq or muwafaqa with the truth and with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and meaning that his his ijtihad his juristic striving or reasoning uh, was in a was in agreement with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with the correct uh, view so that means he was rewarded with two views because he was from Ahlul Ijtihad. He was a Sahabi Jalil uh, who had ilm wa fiqh. And in his Ijtihad, because maybe he was not aware of the actual uh, statement or ruling of the Prophet, وسلم, and he made Ijtihad in this issue. So this shows us the permissibility of Ijtihad as well. And the way in this relates to the uh, benefit and greatness of Abdullah bin Mas'ud is that through his ijtihad, his ijtihad was in accordance with the 
with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the truth. And this shows that this was a ni'mah or a blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, upon Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the permissibility of becoming happy uh, when, with regards to uh, being in accordance, making a ruling in accordance with the truth. That this is permissible and this is not, uh, has nothing to do with arrogance or a lack of shyness or a lack of anything else, but rather this is showing the uh, the blessing that and the love for the truth that one uh, strove in their uh, ijtihad and then they had uh, they were in accordance with the truth. So this is this shows that this is permissible and that this is something uh, this 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 is a great uh, thing that one should be happy about. So it shows that it's permissible to be happy about those things and rejoice in being upon the haq, being upon the truth. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it's permissible for uh, that in, in the marriage contract for it to take place without specifying the mahar, without having a predetermined specified mahar without naming the mahar. And the reason we know this because Ibn Mas'ud <coughs> radiallahu ta'ala an, he did not make inkar or he did not deny this fact or say that this was something bad. However, to prevent uh, controversy and fitna later, perhaps in the marriage, especially if divorce results or if there's some confusion between the husband and wife, then of course the best is to name and pay and give the mahar uh, immediately in, in, the, uh, in the marital contract. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that if a woman uh, did not stipulate her mahar uh, and that uh, if she did not stipulate a specific amount or a specific mahar then her mahar, her sadat or her uh, her dowry is to be the, the same amount uh, as is customary for her people. For example, if she's from a specific tribe and the women of that tribe take a, a certain, usually accept a certain amount for their mahar, then her ma mahar, her, her uh, dowry would be the same as her tribe. Likewise, uh, maybe she comes from a society that isn't tribal, but the people in her, her, uh, her custom, according to her, her custom, they usually take a certain amount or take a certain gift, then her gift would be in accordance with that. Or she has sisters and her sisters have married and their gift uh, or their mahar was, um, you know, related to a certain amount or there's some sort of average amongst her sisters, then that would be the case. So uh, in the case of none of those things, none of those situations, it would just go back to the custom of that people. Even if they're reverts, there perhaps is a, a custom amongst Sisters, so then you would look to what those sisters in that society in general what they ask for. Maybe they ask for Sahih Bukhari and uh, some sort of garment or something to the val equal to that value. Then that would be for the Imam or what have you, uh, or the guardian or someone in the community who is responsible to determine the amount. Uh, of her mahar in accordance with her her uh, custom. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that if uh, someone 
if the, the husband dies or if the wife dies and it was before they had relations, then the, the, uh, the woman is entitled to the full mahar that was agreed upon or the full, the full uh, dowry in accordance with that custom. So um, if the husband died and the mahar was not stipulated, for example, then the woman would be entitled to the full uh, amount of the dowry and that money would come from his inheritance or his, uh, his uh, family members, his next of kin that inherit from him. Uh, likewise, if the woman died, then that mahar would still be, the man would still be responsible for that, uh, for that amount, and that would go to her next of, uh, you know, those who inherit from her. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So those are just some of the main benefits uh, of this hadith. In the next hadith, narrated Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if anyone gives as a dowry to a woman some flower or dates, he has made her lawful for himself. Abu Dawood reported it and indicated that the stronger opinion is that it is mokuf, meaning a saying, of a companion of Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala anhum aj, uh, What we learn from this hadith though, in this narration, one of the benefits of this hadith <coughs> is that it shows us, it illustrates for us, that the sadaq or the mahar or the dowry is correct regardless of the amount. There, there, there's no <coughs> minimum amount that it, whether it's a, a lot, a large amount, or it's a minimal amount, then it is still uh, correct, uh, still considered a valid uh, dowry in mahab. And one of the things that removes some of these difficulties that we found in this hadith is by stipulating the mahar that a woman being clear uh, about her her dowry and then this helps to avoid the uh, sometimes confusion that can result by not mentioning a specific mahar uh, another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also illustrates for us that it's permissible uh, that food is uh, food items are permissible forms uh, permissible to be given as a mahar. That a mahar can be a food item, uh, item as was mentioned in this hadith, that uh, uh, that uh, in the hadith of Jabir, radiallahu ta'ala, that uh, he mentioned regardless of whether it was flour or dates. So letting us know that something as simple as flour and dates can be given as a mahar. And especially uh, some of these uh, items are specific to particular customs and time that in the time of the Prophet وسلم, because they lived in very uh, severe climate and severe times where people were uh, you know having difficulty and and so forth then even something as simple as dates and flour had m much more value to it than the way uh, then then we give it in in our times when we have uh in many societies we are blessed to have um many more options for food items but with that being said what we learn from this hadith is that it's permissible to even give uh something as simple as uh food as a uh, mahar another benefit derived from this hadith <coughs> is that uh, the only way that a woman is made permissible for a man is through sadaq, is through uh, a mahar uh, in, in the marital bond. That 
she must be given uh, a mahar. This is what makes her lawful. And this is in accordance with the statement uh, that Jabir said, that the Prophet والسلام, said, if anyone gives us a dowry to a woman, if anyone gives as a dowry to a woman some flower or dates, he has made her lawful for himself. Letting us know that the mahar is what makes uh, the woman lawful for, uh, for a man in the marital bond. In the next hadith, <clears throat> narrated Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Rabi'ah, on the authority of his father, the Prophet sallallahu gave his approval of the marriage of a woman for two sandals as a dowry. Uh, a Tirmidhi reported it and graded it as sahih or authentic, but he was opposed in that grading of the hadith. Uh, in this hadith, this hadith uh, clarifies the permissibility of giving something uh, simple uh, as a, a gift for a mahar. Basically meaning that uh, anything can be given as a gift uh, if it has some, uh, some value, some value to it. And the value can be even something minimal, but it's still something valuable. And as we mentioned, that contextualizing this hadith, these hadith, to realize that maybe for yourself or in your custom, something simple like sandals would not have a lot of value. But maybe in another custom, this may have uh, great value. And in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you find that some of the people were very restricted in means. Some of the Sahaba were very, very poor and that they didn't have uh, much of anything. So even just simply the pair of sandals carried value for them. Whereas we are blessed uh, to have many things. But the point being is that something of little value, but as long as it has some sort of value, can be given as a maha, something very simple. So, and going back to the hadith that we already mentioned, that the Prophet ﷺ said the best maha, or the best dowry, is that which is the easiest, you know, meaning the easiest to pay. That is something simple and not so difficult that's going to be a great burden that the suitor has to go into debt in order to uh, pay uh, the maha. So from this hadith, uh, we learned that uh, that it's permissible to give something very minimal for a mahar as long as it, it has value. And likewise, uh, we learn from this hadith or a benefit of this hadith is that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this, this points out a very uh, important uh, principle regarding the sunnah, that if the Prophet ﷺ agreed to, to something or accepted something, allowed for something to take place in his presence, then this is something that you can use as evidence for its permissibility. You can make istidlal of that thing. And in this situation, that the Prophet ﷺ agreed and allowed for uh, something as simple as sandals to be given as a mahar, so therefore, you can make istidlal of that to say that it is permissible to give something as simple as sandals as a dowry, and that is sufficient. So that means you can make that as use as uh, evidence that this is a permissible practice. And so that's an important principle of the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. In the next hadith, narrated sahal, Ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married a woman uh, married a man to a woman for a dowry of an iron ring Al-Hakam reported it it is a portion of a, a long hadith proceeding in the beginning of the book of marriage that we already mentioned uh, uh, 
This uh, hadith also illustrates for us, as we uh, already mentioned, that it is permissible to give uh, something simple, something of minimal value uh, as a uh, as a mahar, that this is permissible to do so, uh, especially, of course, if the woman is, uh, if she's willing to accept that, or basically, to restate that, only if the woman is willing to accept that. If she doesn't accept that, then, of course, uh, the suitor must give her what she wants, or he will not be able to marry her. But this shows us the permissibility of giving something simple, uh, of minimal value, as a mahar. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that it's permissible to wear, uh, you know, a metal ring or uh, to wear metal. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ would not have ordered uh, and, and allowed for that to be given as a mahar if it was impermissible to use and benefit from. In the next hadith, narrated Ali radiallahu anh, the dowry should not be less than 10 dirhams. A darqutni reported it as mokuf, a saying of a companion, meaning the saying of Ali radiallahu anh. Also, there is a defect in its chain of narrators. So this is a weak hadith. So it doesn't carry a hukum and it goes against all the other ahadith that we've mentioned that have shown that there is no minimal uh, amount to be given as a mahar, nor a maximum amount. However, we should not be extravagant, and of course, it should not be something which is insulting. And this, again, is in accordance with the determination of the woman who is being uh, proposed to, that this is her right, this is her choice, whatever she decides as her mahar, and that is her Haq, and it belongs to her, as we mentioned prior to this hadith. In the next hadith, narrated uh, Uqbar ibn Amr, radiallahu ta'ala an, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, the best dowry is that which is most easy. Abu Dawood reported it, and Al-Hakam graded it as authentic or sahih. This hadith uh, shows us as the Prophet ﷺ said, خير, خير that the best of mahars, the best of the uh, dowry is that, or the best dowry is that which is most easy, meaning most easy upon the man for him to pay, making it not a difficult burden upon him, that he should not be going into debt and so forth. And again, this also, there is a, uh, in relation, the Prophet ﷺ said, that the best dowry is the easiest, uh, the, 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 the easiest one to pay. And so this also is rel relative to particular customs and to particular individuals, meaning that if someone has, uh, is it, has been endowed with a lot of wealth by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the grace and mercy and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his favor, that that they have uh, uh, an easier time to pay, they can afford to pay a higher maha. So for example, if a woman were to say, for example in America, where we deal with dollars, and if she said, I want for my maha $20,000, for example. For a very wealthy man, that is very little. That, that's nothing for him. That's very easy for him to pay, and so that's not something uh, which would be a great burden. He doesn't have to take a loan. He doesn't have to take anything. He can probably simply go to his bank or whatever the case may be and bring out the cash and there's no difficulty for him. But for the average Muslim in America, that would probably be burdensome. That would be, a, in fact, it would be a great burden. In fact, I know for many reverts who are new to the religion that relative to their situation, many of them, more often than not, are, uh, you know, are not uh, wealthy people, okay? They're average people and sometimes less than average as far as their, their income. They have, they're from the lower income bracket. 
So for them, and often what tends to be the custom in my experience is I've seen people given the Mus'ah, uh, given the Quran, given a Sahih al Bukhari. Women have demanded that or demanded just simply one outfit, a, a garment. You know, not even gold or, or something because it is not tend to be from their custom. However, it, relative to the custom, maybe someone from a more traditional family, for example, you find among Somalis or Pakistanis uh, in America that they will, because they have their traditional societies, and if they are not very religious people often, and they're just from the average uh, Muslim, and what I mean by religious, they're not studied and, and studying the religion and so forth, but maybe they practice, maybe they, uh, they pray and things like this, but they tend to be tied to their traditions quite a bit, then for them, gold is very important. Then perhaps it will be gold and maybe $5,000. You know, it, it just depends on the, the custom of the people and, and so forth. And so then you would have to look to see uh, the, the particular suitor. Is that a great burden for him or is that something that those families already prepare for that? Those families often in tribal societies and customs, they're often already prepared. They know for them when they get married, it's a very big deal. And so they've been preparing for it for years, perhaps. So they've already saved a certain amount of money or uh, they know that it's going to require a certain amount of money and the family's already willing to help. So they have already got a chest of gold for the woman or something like this or a few thousand dollars plus gold and plus this and furniture for the home or whatever the case may be. So this is also relative. However, going back to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which this hadith uh, is emphasizing that the, to make it easy upon the suitor. So if, that, if those customs are easy upon the suitor, then of course, then that would be in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If the, the suitor is someone of, of, of you know, they're a wealthy uh, individual and they can afford that, then that would not be something which is burdensome upon them. In the, uh, the last hadith of this, of this chapter, the chapter of the Mahar, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Uh, Amra, Amra, radiallahu ta'ala anha, the daughter of Al Ju'an. Al Jum sought refuge in Allah from Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when she was brought into him, meaning when he married her. And he said, You have sought refuge in the one worthy of seeking refuge in. Then he divorced her and commanded Usama, who gave her three garments as a gift of her dowry. Ibn Majah reported it, but there is a rejected narrator in its chain of narrators. The origin of the aforesaid story is found in Sahih, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari from Abu Usaid al-Sa'idi's uh, 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 hadith. Uh, this hadith here, in this hadith, uh, it mentions, it shows that the Prophet ﷺ did not fix the dowry. The dowry was not already predetermined and, and mentioned. Uh, did not fix the dowry of that woman and before having relations with her, uh, divorced and gave her three pieces of clothing. Three pieces of clothing, garments. It means that if the dowry is not decided and the woman is divorced, before sexual intercourse, she must be given some clothing at least, some sort of gift. Uh, and the maximum she can be given uh, is a slave or a slave girl. This is called muta at-talaq. So this is one of the types of, uh, of mahars to be given uh, in the case of uh, a woman being divorced before having relations uh, with the husband and where the mahar has not been stipulated 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Bab al Walima. So the Walima or the wedding celebration is something which helps to distinguish uh, and, and advertise that uh, people are joined in the marital bond. So this is something which is a very important sign that people are rejoicing and uh, coming together in the bond of marriage. So this is a very important celebration which is a legislated mashroor legislation in Islam. Uh, the word walima uh, is derived from the word uh, wal, which means to join because the husband and the wife have united. So to join, this is in its uh, literal sense. And of course, this is a reference and used to denote that the marital bond has taken place between the husband and the wife. And awlama, uh, which is uh, a, a verb form of walm, which is a noun, uh, it is described or it is used to describe every type of uh, banquet held to celebrate an, uh, an occasion. So in the Arabic language, and in fact, you'll find <coughs> that even as a Sharia term, that the term uh, walima is also used uh, in a general term for uh, to denote that there is celebration. Uh, and the walima of marriage is held when the marriage is consummated or when the wife goes to live with the husband. And we see that in different customs there tends to be a variant of practices and this is uh, what is considered mishroor or in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Uh, one of the important points regarding the walima is that it is preferred for this wedding bank uh, banquet or uh, walima to be held with one sheep or more. Uh, and this comes from the hadith of Anas ibn Malik عنه, that the Prophet وسلم, saw Abdurrahman with some yellow stains on his clothes and asked him, uh, what is this, O Abdurrahman? He replied, I have married a woman for a date stone's weight in gold. He said, May Allah bless you. Hold a wedding feast, even if it is only with a single sheep. Uh, and this is an authentic hadith, and this is the hadith, first hadith that we will cover in this chapter. Uh, another point regarding the walima in general is that the scholars mentioned that it is obligatory to accept an invitation to a walima of marriage, that if someone is invited, of course, if there's not some extreme hardship, someone says, please come to Saudi Arabia to attend my walima, or something like this, or, or something that is a great burden, then of course the person, bidden the law, would be exempted from this. But however, the scholars, uh, they mention that it is an obligation to accept this invitation and try strive your utmost to attend the uh, the marriage celebration, the marriage banquet. And this comes from uh, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'an that he said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam said if any one of you is invited to a walima let him attend it. This is an authentic hadith. Uh, also uh, it was reported on Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'an as well that he said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if any one of you is invited, let him accept, and if he is fasting, he should pray in order to bless the inmates of the house, or the people who live in the house. Uh, and if he is not fasting, he should eat. This is a, an authentic hadith as well. So those are just some important uh, points regarding the wedding banquet. And, you know, the first being that the that is mashru, of course, to have a, a recommended to have a walima and that it is preferred to have this walima uh, with one sheep or more. And the second uh, main point to consider is that if one is invited 
to attend a walima, to attend a celebration, then they should uh, they should attend it. So, Bab or chapter four, Bab and Wanima, the chapter of the wedding feast, <clears throat> and the first hadith. Uh, before we get into the first hadith, that uh, it, it is important for us to understand that there is uh, a difference of opinion regarding the, obliga uh, the obligation of the wedding and feast. And as we mentioned, so some of the scholars say that it's uh, recommended, some say that it's uh, an obligation, and that this is a part of uh, announcing the nikah, announcing the marriage, uh, the marital bond that has taken place. Uh, however, according to the majority of the scholars, that it is sunnah. It's from the sunnah, the meaning it's recommended. Uh, there's also a difference of opinion about the time of the wedding feast. Uh, it is considered better to have the wedding feast when the sexual relations have uh, taken place at karamakum Allah. Narrated Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala the Prophet وسلم, saw the trace of yellow color in Abdurrahman ibn Auf تنعن, and asked, What is this? He replied, O Messenger of Allah, وسلم, I have married a woman for a nawat weight equal to the weight of a date stone of gold. He وسلم, said, May Allah bless you, hold a wedding feast, even if with a sheep only. Meaning it's agreed upon, and the wording is that in uh, Sahih Muslim. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, there are many uh, immense benefits of this hadith. One of the benefits, one of the first benefits we gain from this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is it shows that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave great importance to in considering his companions, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een, that he paid attention to them. And so this shows that it is... Uh, from the qualities of leadership to have uh, to pay attention and give uh, importance to your flock and give importance to those who you are in charge over whether it be the leader of a country whether it be the leader uh, you know of a company or whether it be the leader of a household those people in positions of authority and that are respond and responsibility that they should be concerned with the uh, well-being uh, of those people they are charged in authority over. And this is in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the way he was with his companions And what shows this and illustrates this for us is that the Prophet وسلم, used to ask about the status and the well-being of his companions And in this hadith uh, the Prophet وسلم, he asked about uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked about you know what what's his status you know what is this he sees on his garment and he was asking about it you know uh, the second benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that it is permissible uh, to mention something even if it was uh, not mentioned you know permissible to remember or mention something even if it was not asked about. Uh, and the Prophet uh, would do this in order to find out uh, you know, the status of his companions and to check about their well-being. Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, he didn't ask about the mahar, but rather he asked what is the reason for this, uh, you know, that he had those, those stains on his garment. And so this shows that the Prophet Sallallahu he was concerned about uh, his companions and the permissibility to uh, mention something or ask about something or mention something even if it was not asked about or mentioned. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu is it also shows that it is permissible uh, for a man to uh, beautify or make himself handsome with, uh, you know, um, with uh, cologne, 
we, we use it. We usually refer to perfume as what women use, but cologne, those and, and atar, uh, those things which are used, the oils to make uh, like musk and scented fragrances uh, to make a person smell good in their garments, to smell good. Uh, and that there is no problem with that, of course. And that the scholars, they mention that for these festive occasions, that this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and that a man should do this, should make himself smell good uh, for, uh, and not expose himself. He should not uh, expose himself in something where you can see his skin, uh, you know, see his aura, of course, uh, you know, keep himself covered and smell good, smell good for the Walima, smell good for Jumwa. All of these things are in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Whereas it's the opposite condition or the opposite situation with women, that a woman should not, uh, especially if she's going to be going out in public, use perfumes and so forth. But the perfumes and the smelling good and uh, these, this beautification is done with regards to her husband and in the company of those women who are, uh, who are, who it's permissible to for uh, to see her like that, you know, and and to see her exposed and beautifying herself excessively, uh, you know, wherever in those situations where there will not be fitna and so forth. So a woman in that situation, she can also, uh, you know, expose herself to a degree that she is uh, not exposing, of course, her private parts and things like this, but, you know, she can wear garments that uh, show her beautification, uh, you know, for walimas and things like this around other women, and where it might even be exposing some of her skin, her hands, her arms, things like this, uh, and, and so on and so forth, that this is, uh, you know, per permissible to beautify herself, Whereas the man would not expose his skin and not expose himself excessively. <clears throat> and another benefit of this hadith is that it is uh, a part of the custom from the custom of, of Islam, Islamic custom in fact, that and, and of course Islamic custom stems from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu That's what we consider Islamic custom, true Islamic custom, not just customs that the Muslims have developed or taken from their ways prior to Islam. But it's true Islamic custom is that what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practiced. And so from the Sunnah and from the Islamic Ada or custom is to, to wear the, for men, to, uh, and, and during the time of marriage, to wear uh, uh, things which make you smell good, to use perfumes, to use colognes or atar and scents, to uh, make yourself, uh, uh, you know, smell, smell good for this great and uh, righteous celebration and occasion. And likewise, this uh, for the women, of course, on that special occasion when she's with her husband, that she should try to smell good and beautify herself. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the that is mashru or legislated to supplicate for the married uh, couple and to supplicate for them with barakah, to ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, فَبَارَكَ لَكْ And may Allah uh, bless you. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala bless you or, or give you blessings in this, this, uh, this uniting, you know, this, in this, uh, you know, in this marital bond. And this barakah, this is a supplication for immense goodness for someone. And that the goodness and the abwab or the means and ways of goodness are immense and there are many paths of goodness. So the one who supplicates for the barakah, they are supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking that he blesses uh, this, these, uh, these, the people who have just been married, gives them the blessings 
uh, and, and the blessings from the various ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows blessings upon his, uh, his servants. And another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us that it is permissible to uh, supplicate with a shortened supplication, meaning there's no hardship in, it's obviously, it's much better to memorize the uh, sunnans and the, to memorize the supplications of the Prophet ﷺ from his authentic sunnah, that this is the best. However, if someone uh, shortens, maybe they didn't memorize or what have you, that this is all, this bab is wasi'ah, that this is, uh, this is open and this is, uh, it's not restricted to where you have to say, supplicate only with the supplication for people. But it's sufficient to say, and as is illustrated <coughs> in this hadith, the Prophet said, Fabarakallah luck, and may, may Allah bless you. Whereas other hadith, Allah uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Barakallah lakuma wa baraka alaykuma wa jama baynukuma fil khair, fi khair. Uh, in another supplication, the Prophet Sallallahu said, and this is, uh, you know, an, another authentic hadith uh, where the Prophet Sallallahu made a much longer dua for, for the merit, marital couple or that he, you know, let us know that this is from his sunnah so that it shows us that there, that it's wasiya, that these affairs are, uh, they're not restricted and limited to where you have to just supplicate with just this one supplication. But in fact, it's sufficient to say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, you know, and, and, and so forth with sincerity. And this is an act of ibadah, this is a supplication, this is worship of Allah and asking him to bestow blessings upon his servants. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is it also shows us, uh, this hadith shows us the, the uh, legislativeness of the walima, that uh, this, this walima and that some of the ulama from this hadith, uh, they deduce that the walima is wajib, as we already mentioned, that it is an obligation. And they uh, say, as we've mentioned countless times, uh, al-asl fil amr al-wujub, that the asl or the origin uh, of a command is that it illustrates that this is an obligation. If there's a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, or there's a command from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu then the asl of that is it illustrates that that uh, is something which is an obligation that Allah has commanded you with. And in that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, May Allah bless you, hold a wedding feast. So this is in the sila or in the way of, 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 co make of an, a, a command in the imperative form. The Prophet ﷺ said, hold a feast. So from this statement in the hadith, some of the scholars deduce that it is an obligation to have the walima. However, uh, that uh, some of the scholars mention that this obligation is in accordance with the ability of a person, meaning that some people are poor. They don't really have much to have a walima. So in this case, this will be a burden on them. They can't afford that, uh, to have a walima. And some people are blessed with something greater. So. Uh, you know, this depends upon the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows that the sharia uh, and that the Muslim should be concerned with, the sharia is concerned with, uh, um, announcing the marital bond, that this, uh, this celebration, this marriage is being announced, that this is uh, from the sharia, this is mishroor. Uh, and the Sharia, uh, uh, you know, makes that apparent. Uh, and likewise, the Muslims should be concerned with that and also making the marital bond uh, apparent. Uh, an another benefit of this hadith is uh, that it shows from this hadith uh, what it can be deduced that the minimal 
for a person who has the means, or a person who's wealthy, or at least has the means, and it's not a burden on them to have a walima, that the minimum that they should do is have a, uh, you know, have one sheep, you know, for that occasion. And that is for the person who, uh, who has the means, for, for someone who is wealthy. For someone who is wealthy, the minimum they should do is, is have one sheep. And those are just some of the benefits that the scholars have mentioned in regards to that hadith.